Statistics show that there are over 8 million Canadians who provide care to a chronically ill or disabled friend or loved one, and 65 million caregivers in the U.S. My next guest knows full well what it is like to be one of those caregivers. Peter Rosenberger has been his wife Gracie's care caregiver since the day they married, journeying with her through 78 operations, 60 physicians, dozens of hospital visits, and health care costs topping $9 million. Because of Peter's years of experience in caregiving, he has become a leading voice in the area with a weekly radio program for caregivers. He's become a public speaker, spokesperson, and author. His new book is Hope for the Caregiver, Encouraging Words to Strengthen Your Spirit. Welcome back, Peter. Oh, it's such a treat. Thank you, Maggie. I, you know, in your book, you talk about not being the superhero and doing what you can. What does that mean? Well, I think we caregivers tend to recklessly hurl ourselves at trying to help a loved one. We're, we're almost panicked about it. Mm. And we think it's all up to us. You can do that for a while. I can stand on my head for three months. But this thing can stretch on for a long, long time. I had a lady come up to me at church and her dad had Alzheimer's and she threw herself into taking care of him. Seven years later, she's bankrupt. Mm -hmm. He's still living and now she doesn't have a job. She doesn't have a company. She, she's, she's really in bad shape because she tried to rescue a situation. You can't, you have to practice really good stewardship on this and recognize that I, I, we don't own this. I, I didn't do this to my wife. She had a car wreck before I ever met her. I did not do this to her. Mm. I can't undo it. That's a God-sized problem. We're stewards of it. If you look back at the garden, our first job was stewards. Mm -hmm. God said, hey, Dad, go take care of this. And we're stewards of this thing. Now, stewardship is not a, not a word we use a lot in our society. I mean, clearly, our the United States is in debt nearly tr $20 trillion. Stewardship, they don't even know what the word means in Washington. But God knows what it means. And we, can, we would learn a lot from the, looking through Scripture and seeing, wait a minute. At no point did God say, jump in there and act like a, a crazy chicken with your head cut off and look busy. Mm. He said, be still, be still, be still. Settle down. It's going to be okay. Sit, simmer down. And that's the whole point of we as caregivers. Stop trying to put on the mask and the cape and run in there you know, to a burning building. You can't maintain that. But how do you... How do you do that? Because you want to save your loved one. You want to take care of your loved one. How do you do that but still uh, have some sort of a rationality through it all because you just want to save that person? Well, first off, you have to recognize you can't save them. Yeah. You didn't cause this. You can't undo it. I, I, my wife's legs are gone. I cannot make those legs grow back. And she's going to fall. There's a chapter in my book called They're Going to Fall. Mm. If she wears prosthetic limbs, she's going to fall. Mm. Now, I can stop her from falling by forcing her to sit in a wheelchair all the time. Now, what is that going to do to her? Granted, I've cured the falling problem now. I have taken that away from her. But what is that going to do to her as a person? Part of life is learning to take your hands off of things that are not yours. I, I, this is not mine. I did not do this. I have a responsibility to be the best steward and care for her. And when she does fall, I comfort her, help her back up, do the best I can. But at the ultimately she has to experience her own experience of this thing. Yeah. Now, if you're dealing with a child with special needs who's too young to make those decisions, that's a different thing. But when you're dealing with adults, you have to really walk a fine line and you detach from it a little bit mm. and recognize, okay, now detaching is not severing. That's amputation. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do that. Detaching is just unlocking and realize that this is not all up to me. Yeah. And I can love them even through this thing. I've had to love and care for Gracie while she was groaning. I don't know if you ever watched another human being groan. I mean, she couldn't even speak. She was in so much pain. And it makes you angry to watch it because you feel so helpless. But it's in that helplessness where we realize, oh, wait a minute, we don't have any power over this. That's when we turn to God on this. And, and, reckon, and suffering has a way of focusing us where we really need to be focused, which is on God. Mm -hmm. Now, how much suffering it's going to take to get us to that point, yeah. that varies from person to person. But ultimately, we, we, we have to cry uncle and say, God, you're in charge of this. I'm not. How important is that faith? Because I think of caregivers that don't have that faith. I, I don't know how you do it. I don't know many caregivers in the 30-year plus club like me yeah. that, that don't have faith because I don't know how you sustain this. Yeah. Uh, and the faith, again, it's not something, it's not pie in the sky. It's, it's a conviction. Mm -hmm. It's an awareness and recognition. My son, when he was... Nine years old, my oldest son asked me, he said, Dad, why should I believe that God cares about my hurts when I see what he allows mom to go through? Mm. Well, that, wow. that right there would cause most theologians to kind of have a panic attack because yeah. how do you answer that? 
And I looked at my son and I said, I don't know why God allows what your mom to go through, what she goes through. I, I have no clue. I'm not going to even speculate. But I do know this. He stretched out his arms and gave his life for us on the cross. Hmm. And he saved us from something far worse than all these things. Amputation, chronic pain, diseases, traumas. If he loves us that much, I'm going to trust him with this other stuff. Hmm. And he looked at me and he just nodded his head. And that was enough for him. And that's enough for me. I don't understand this. And people that tell you that they do, get away from them because stupid is contagious. <laughs> I don't want to be around people like that because they don't know. God didn't ask us to be consultants. He just asked us to trust Him. And how do we know we can trust Him? Because He stretched out His hands. Mm. And if the next time you think this is all up to you, look down at your own hands. If you don't see nail prints, this is not yours to fix. Mm. This is not yeah, yours. That's a great point. Feelings that caregivers go through, <clears throat> isolation, fear, guilt, anxiety. How do you deal with these issues? You slow down. You slow down. Uh, I call it the fog of caregiving, mm -hmm. fear, obligation, and guilt. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you get to a fog? If you're driving in a fog, you guys have fog here in Canada, yeah, we right? Do. Okay, I just want to make sure it's not a <laughs> fog free nation here. But uh, when you get to a fog, you slow down. Yeah. You don't drive fast. I was out in Montana one time driving in some snow coming from West Yellowstone to Big Sky, and we get into the park, I mean, the wilderness area, and they have the double tiered reflectors there. And the snow was blanket. There was no, there was no lights. The, the, it, it, was, it was one of those kind of things where you're gripping the steering wheel really, really tight. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't see the road because it had covered up the road. But I saw the reflectors on either side. And all I could see was one reflector at a time. But I knew if I stayed between those reflectors, I was on the road. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't go into the Gallatin River there next to me. That's the way it is when you deal with this. You slow down and you look at the, the reflectors that you have, whatever that God has for you right at that place. And you just deal with today as it is. Our culture doesn't lend itself to dealing with today. Give us this day our daily bread. Mm. That preaches really well until you have to live it. Mm. But that's how we're called to do. I can't deal with the past anymore. You can look at it, but don't stare because I can't do anything about it. Future's over here. Can't do anything about that either. All I can deal with is today. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. And we wrench ourselves into that mentality. That's the only way you're going to survive this thing. How do we encourage caregivers. I know, you know, I find it, found it quite funny and interesting as you wrote in this book about some really, let's say, stupid things that people have said to you, <laughs> insensitive yeah. things people have said to you, in the spirit of trying to be ministerial and trying to comfort. They come they up with goofy very things. very insecure, th yeah, very, yeah. Well, Spirit brother, I'm going to pray for you. They say that. <laughs> I get that a lot. Brother, I'm going to pray for you. Well, what does that even mean? What yeah. are you going to pray? You going to pray your legs grow back? You go, what are you going to pray? It's like going to the post office and you see some guy carrying a bunch of boxes. Brother, you look to be burdened down. I'm going to pray for you. Mm. Well, hold the door while you do it. <laughs> you know, and what I tell caregivers, here's how you look, here's how you help a caregiver. Here's how you talk to them. You say very quietly, because they're pretty frazzled. Our nerves are getting kind of frazzled. And you say quietly, say, look, I see you. Mm. I see you. And I see the enormity of what you're carrying. And I hurt for you. Mm. You say it very gently to them. Let them know that they're not invisible. Let's just start with that. If you do nothing else, just to let them know that, that you see them and you see the magnitude of what they're doing and you hurt for them. Then God will show you ways to be able to care for them when you're at the grocery store. Hey, I'm over here. Do you need a, you need a gallon of milk? I'll bring one by. I'm from the South. I don't know if y'all figured that out or not, but down there we got it. You know, wherever two or three are gathered, there's macaroni and cheese. We know what to do for short-term stuff. <laughs> But you can only take so many meals before somebody's got to learn how to cook. Yeah. But you can drop off things. Uh, we have a lot of leaves that fall in my area. You don't want a caregiver up on the roof mm. cleaning gutters. Say, hey, I got a service I could send over to do gutters. Or when's the last time you saw your doctor? Of those 8 million Canadians that are not seeing their doctor, I mean, 72% uh, of them don't see their own doctor. Yeah. Three quarters of them. Well, that's a time bomb. How are you going to take care of somebody if you're not healthy? So can I sit with them while you go see your doctor? Mm. That's a start. And as you do these things, God will show you how to care for them, but you do it very gently. I love the point about seeing the caregiver. Because you're right, many times we see the person that is in need at that moment. We see the person in the wheelchair, the person with the crutches, and we don't see the caregiver. The person pushing the wheelchair, the yes. person standing in the hospital room corner. Yeah, that's important. And it is, and they feel invisible. We lose our identity anyway. We become codependent on somebody else's story. I can't tell you, Maggie, how many people have asked me about my wife over the years. Mm. But I can tell you the ones that have asked about me. Mm. And, and you know what happens when a codependent dies? 
somebody else's life flashes in front of their eyes. You know, you don't want that. You want to learn to, to live your own life through this thing. And I, I think the lesson for me was driven home when my pastor asked me to play the piano at the beginning of church when people were coming in. And I've been accompanying Gracie for years as a singer. So I sat down to play just myself. People are coming in and I'm playing the chords, but I'm not playing the melody because I was hearing her voice in my head. And I realized this is pretty, but it doesn't mean anything. And I had to go back and teach myself the melody. And I had to, of songs I've been playing since I was this high, but I realized I lost the melody somewhere. I have to find my own melody through this thing. So Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Speak in first person singular. That's how you help a caregiver, learning to help, how to help them get their own voice out. And spending time caring for themselves, going out to the movies you talk about, investing in themselves, going on a trip, setting aside that time and being um, deliberate about investing in yourself. How important is that? I had somebody ask me, I just got my black belt uh, in martial arts. I, I do a lot of things. And somebody said, uh, it was a caregiver at a military base taking care of her husband. Mm -hmm. said, How do you find time for this? I don't find time for it. I make time for it. Mm. I've been doing this for 30 years. If I don't make time for myself on this thing, if I don't make time for stillness, I'm going to have to take time for illness. Yeah. I mean, if I don't do these things, I'm no good to my wife for the next potentially 30 years. But some people will worry, Peter, that, you know, it's perception. Oh, people are going to see me going in the movies or me investing in, you know, getting my black belt and they're going to think that I'm, you know, neglecting my job as a caregiver. Do we worry about that? No, you can't fix stupid. You know, we got to say it down here in the South. You, can't, you just let people be who they are. I'm not responsible for their stupid beliefs. I'm not. I have, I am, I've got a woman who suffers who is depending on me to make good decisions. And I will listen to critics in direct proportion to how much they help me. And if they're not helping, then their opinion is irrelevant to me. I, and I, I, that's one of the things I want to help empower my fellow yeah. caregivers with. You don't have to take that kind of stuff from people. Just avoid them. Just give them, just mm. give them a lot of distance. Thank you, Peter. Oh, we could talk forever. Again, the book is Hope for the Caregiver, Encouraging Words to Strengthen Your Spirit. Thank you so much, Peter, for being Thank with us. Thank you very us. much for having me. And if you're watching today and you're a caregiver or even someone who is dependent on a caregiver and you need prayer, you want somebody to just help you through some of those struggles that maybe Peter has talked about, uh, remember that we have prayer lines available 24-7. Great people on the other end of that line that want to pray with you, want to journey with you. Again, the number is right there, 1-866-273-4444.